So that leaves us to study Genesis 18. Let's say a prayer before we get going tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. And as we study tonight, a passage that has not only been controversial in recent years, but is also something we tend to neglect as being applicable to us. I pray that we would learn more about who you are and what your will is and how uh, we could better humble ourselves before a holy and righteous God who takes sin seriously. And so we thank you for giving us your grace and for teaching us lessons like in Genesis 19. Amen. Okay, tonight we're in Genesis 18, going to finish up the chapter, and then we're going to try to cover most of chapter 19. And the topic throughout these passages is Sodom and Gomorrah. And so as we deal with the, the events that happen in Sodom and Gomorrah, and no doubt you're familiar from your uh, Bible reading and Sunday school classes and whatnot of the story of how uh, God uh, judges Sodom and Gomorrah and wipes them out with brimstone and fire from heaven. And so as we read this, it's, it's, it's common for Christians to read it with a little bit of self-righteousness, a little bit of self-heightened uh, uh, you know, uh, thinking about ourselves in that uh, we, don't, we're, we wouldn't be part of Sodom and Gomorrah. We just wouldn't live there. It's such a bad town, uh, we would not be a part of that. And we tend to uh, ex- you know, make the sins that are committed there something we are never a part of. And uh, we do that by making it a single sin, number one, and homosexuality. And then number two saying, well, we just would never be a part of that. And yet, as we look more and more around our culture and look in detail in the Bible about what the sins were in Sodom and Gomorrah, we see that um, uh, there's a lot of them there. And there's a lot of them that perhaps you're familiar with and that, that touch close to home. And so it's something we need to really t- take some uh, time to consider uh, what it has to say and what it's trying to teach us. It's not just a story in the Bible that describes God being angry at people and killing them. Um, There's a reason for why God put this here, and he says so, why it's there, and not even why he judged Sodom and Gomorrah, but why it's in our Bible. As we've seen in every chapter in Genesis, every chapter and recorded event in here has a purpose, typically to teach us something about what God's going to do later in the Bible, but also about his character and his mode of operation, his way of doing things. And so that's what we're going to be learning tonight, uh, trying to see what we can learn about who God is and how he acted back here in a time when the only intervention that God had, his purpose at that time, was through one man, Abraham, and we covered the last couple weeks, his covenant of circumcision and promise to him, so that if the nations of the world, if people of the world would bless him, they would then be blessed. And we've seen in the past how that uh, Lot, Abraham's nephew, was part of that blessing in which he went with Abraham, blessed him, and so God protected him multiple times, not only from the kings of the east in Genesis 14, but here again in Genesis 19 uh, from people in his own town, Genesis 19 and Sodom and Gomorrah. So we're going to start in Genesis 18, around verse 16. We left off last week, if you recall, where three men, he calls them men in the Bible, but one of them was the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah God, And the other two were angels that come to Abraham uh, in the afternoon while he's living in his tent in the plains of Mamre. And so here's Abraham living his life. And here come these three men, one of them being the Lord. He takes them in. We covered that reception last week. And he prepares this meal for them. He, He waits on them. He's their servant. And then God gives him the promise. The Lord who's there eating with Abraham gives him that promise of a child that would be born of his wife Sarah. So we covered in detail the importance of Sarah in that promise and in the covenant. And we even covered how both Abraham and Sarah laughed when they first heard the news that it's going to be through her that the promised child would come. So in Genesis 18, verse 15, uh, the Lord calls Sarah out on that even when she she denies that she laughed at all because she did it secretly. And and the Lord says, no, you did laugh, uh, but that's all right, Sarah. You're still going to have that child. So in verse 16, after this, the men rose up from there, from thence, and looked toward Sodom. Uh, across the hills, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. So after they received the hospitality of Abraham, they started to move on. Uh, Their real agenda was not only to explain the promise further to Abraham and Sarah, but to um, go to Sodom and Gomorrah, as we'll learn, to destroy them. And so that was where they were going. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, uh, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So God here, this is a conversation he's having with himself about, hey, should I let Abraham in on what I'm doing? Uh, which is fascinating because not too often before Abraham do we see God doing that. Uh, we see God talking with Adam, but then sin happened and they got kicked out of the garden. We see God talking to Cain and Abel, 
But ever since Cain and Abel, before the flood, there was no account of God talking to people besides Noah. Um, and so it's very rare in the first 2,500 years of human history that God, we have record of God talking to people. Uh, but in Genesis 18, not only do we see chapter after chapter of God talking to Abraham, but here again we see God, God's thoughts and in him saying, shouldn't I tell Abraham about what I'm going to do? And the reason why is because it's going to be helpful for Abraham's children and for the whole world, quite frankly, because Abraham will be a blessing to the nations. When it says in verse 18, the nations of the earth. And so it's interesting to see and read about what God is going to do and why. Uh, by the way, we should never take that for granted, okay? Apparently, God can do what he wants. He is God, okay? And he is not obligated to tell us what he's doing because he's God, okay? We are the creation, he's the creator. But just because in the Bible he chooses to tell Abraham and then eventually chooses to reveal this whole scripture so that you can know what God is doing is an, is an extreme privilege to know that, to know God's thoughts, uh, to try to declare that God is doing something that he has not said explicitly that he's doing is at the very least presumption and at the very worst blasphemy, okay? Because you just simply do not know and could be attributing something to God that he did not do, okay? So it's a privilege to have these, these thoughts of God recorded and the things, uh, the purposes of God recorded in the Bible, and we should not take that lightly, adding to them or taking them away which was the intent of all those instructions in your Bible, not to add to or take away the Bible, because it contains what God is doing, okay? And so we need to be careful of that and, and appreciate that. But Genesis 18, in verse 18, he says, Abraham shall, shall become a great nation, a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. That's, of course, the result of the promise God made with him. And God knows it's going to happen. He knows it's going to happen because he will fulfill what he promised. And so he's looking at the future here. And he says in verse 19, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. So here, God says, the Jehovah God says, I know Abraham. It's not only that I made a promise with him that he's going to be a mighty nation anyway, and so it's a good thing I tell him my purpose so that he can record it for progeny, but I know Abraham and know that he's faithful. And he knows that, we saw, didn't we see last chapter, that Abraham the self same day circumcised himself and his whole household, faithful to what God told him that he needed to keep as part of the covenant. So God knows him and he, that he will command his children in his household. Now, this is interesting because God says he knows Abraham, and yet the self-righteous Pharisees thousands of years later question Jesus Christ that, they even knew, that he even knew Abraham. Remember that? So Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, comes down and he manifests himself uh, with these miracles and with these signs, with his teaching. And they question, how does he know what Abraham would do? And of course, that's confessing their own ignorance. They're just blind to who they're talking to because Jesus Christ is the Lord. Jesus Christ is God. And Jesus Christ was back here talking to Abraham and eating lunch with him. And the fact that they say, how do you know Abraham? You know, do you, or were you before Abraham? Means they refuse to accept that he is the son of God. Okay, remember in John chapter uh, 8, verse 57, where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. He was back there, and we've covered that before. And so th this is a connection even to Jesus' earthly ministry, proving uh, his, his deity. But he says, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, and the Lord may bring upon, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And so he, it's not only God has promised it, but he knows that Abraham will be faithful to pass it down to his sons and his sons' sons and so on. By the way, this is the first uh, passage in verse 19 here we see in the Bible of any type of instruction or record of, of how God intends families to operate. We see back in, in Adam and Eve how God made a wife for the husband, and, and we saw the two become one back there. But here we have uh, God talking about Abraham being faithful to the way of the Lord by teaching his children. In fact, he says, commanding his children and his household. And he explains here part of the responsibility of Abraham as a father to his family, to instruct them in the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, okay, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken. And so there's good instructions here for fathers, good instructions here for a family a structure in that the father commands his children in his house. It's not a democracy in a household. There's the father, then there's the wife to help him, and then there's the children, you see. And the intent of all that is so that there is justice, there is order 
that God has designed, in Genesis 18, verse 19. So that's, that's a, if you're doing a study in your Bible about families and, and how you ought to be a parent, that would be one verse there for your collection. But in verse 20, it says, And the Lord said, Because the cry, so he thought in verse 17 and 18 and 19 in himself. But in verse 20, he starts to speak and says, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. So God says, because of the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to go down to investigate of whether or not it's deserving to punish them or not. And of course, God knows the end from the beginning, so he's going to know the answer. But notice in this one verse, in verse, 21, or verse 20, when God starts out his explanation with because. God is not sending these two angels of destruction, which we'll see in the next chapter, that's what they are. They're angels being sent to destroy. He's not sending them there to start trouble. He's not sending them there to cause division. Okay? The Sodomites and the Gomorrahites were the ones causing the trouble, you see. And in fact, for a long time, the cry of their sinfulness, some people make the connection back to Abel and how his blood cried from the ground, you know, that sort of thing. God hears the cries of, of the, the injustices and the, and, the, and the wickedness in the world. And so God hears those. And he says, because of that, I'm going down to check things out. I'm going out to investigate, okay? And so when people ask in your Bible, why does God judge people? Why did God destroy the entire city of Sodom and Gomorrah? All the, the women and the children and the men. Why did he instruct Israel to go destroy whole cities? Why did he do that? Why did he, with a flood, destroy everyone on the planet, save eight people? Why? And they kind of leave that open-ended question, doubting God's moral character, okay? When in actuality, the, the Bible explains why. Every time it explains why. There's never a time in the Bible where God uh, uh, condemns people and judges them without an explanation of why. Okay? Unlike this world where we get a lot of injustices and a lot of lack of explanations. Okay? So in Genesis 18, verse 20, he says, it's because of their grievous sin. Their sin is very grievous. Okay? That's why. That's why he's coming down. God is not a capricious God just uh, getting angry at every little thing man does, throwing down lightning bolts like the Greeks thought their gods did. He's not doing that, okay? In fact, up until Genesis 18, we're seeing uh, God being a long-suffering God, a merciful God. It's been thousands of years since God created Adam and Eve. He is merciful and long-suffering. We've seen that in every page so far of the Old Testament, of this, uh, of the, of this beginning part of our Bible here in Genesis 18. Okay, and it's because of their sin. It's typical of humanity to try to minimize our sin and try to say, well, our sin isn't that bad. Well, if anyone would know, it would be God because every sin is a sin against him. That is what sin is, by the way. It's something contrary to God. And so how would you know what God is like without knowing God? You see, and that's typically what happens is people who do not know God, do not claim to know God, tend to say their sin isn't that bad. And that's because they don't know God. Thus, they don't know sin. They don't know what it is. But God says their sin is very grievous, so it's time to go down. By the way, we need to compare this to Genesis chapter 15. If you turn to Genesis 15, verse 16. Remember a few chapters ago, when God gave Abram the, uh, the prophecy, the vision about his children and how 400 years later, he would have this nation born from him, you know, and then they would come back to the land. But they, they're not going to come back before that because of a reason. In Genesis 15, it says, in the fourth generation, they shall come here. So Abraham's not going to come back and claim the land. Even his son's not going to come back and claim the land. Even his son's son's not going to come back and claim the land. It's not until the fourth generation or after it says that they're going to come back and claim the land. And the reason he gives is that the people living in the land right now, the Amorites, their iniquity is not yet full. You see, the reason why God did not bring Israel back before he did was because when they were going to come back, they were going to conquer. And it wasn't time yet for the Amorites currently existing in that land that they had filled up their sin worthy of that punishment, you see. And so Israel was a, a rod in God's hand to distribute punishment to people in the land who had sinned grievously by the time they got there. But in Genesis 15, the Amorites, their iniquity was not yet full. Now, you would think just one sin would be enough, right? But God is merciful, you see. God is long-suffering. God is patient. And he says, no, it's not time to kick them out. It's not time 
for the Amorites to, to see judgment and punishment. And that's four generations later from this time. So the Amorites, they had children and children and grandchildren, and it was not time yet. You see, God knows, and he is perfectly righteous. Abraham says later, he's the judge of all the earth. He knows when to bring judgment. What we learn from Genesis 6 and the flood, what we learn from Genesis 19, when judgment does come, is that God will bring judgment. And we should not tempt God just because he is merciful and long-suffering and gracious in this dispensation that we're, we say, well, God's always going to be this way. And there's never going to be a time that God brings justice and judgment anymore. That's tempting God, and that's denying the reality that it will come. That's why we have the record of the flood in Genesis 6, 7, and that's why we have Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, to remind us not only the, the level of our sin, but also that sin will be dealt with. And so we should not wait. We should not linger, as we'll see in a little bit, Lot does when, when the angels tell him to leave Sodom. He lingers around. He's like, well, maybe I just a little bit longer. And the angels kick him out. They know you better leave today because it's coming. So meanwhile, uh, their sin was very grievous. Uh, now you say, what sin was that? I mean, surely I'm not a sinner like those Sodomites, right? So people, and we'll talk about in a bit, here, uh, in a bit about what sin that is and what sins there are there in Sodom. But uh, like I said, people typically read this, this passage about Sodom and Gomorrah and read only one sin and say, that's the worst sin. And they politicize it. And they say, that sin is worse than the rest. And I'm not that. And people I know don't do that. My family doesn't do that. And that's why we're good and they're bad. That's why they deserve fire and brimstone and I don't. Right? Well, you're wrong. And we'll see here in a bit. Because Christ died for ungodly sodomites just like he died for ungodly you. Americans, you see. And so we're going to learn what this, what, what this sin is. But really, does it matter which sin it is? God said it's a grievous sin. Their sin is very grievous. If God says that, it's bad, isn't it? It's bad. Does it matter which sin it is? Maybe it's just disobedience to their parents. Maybe it's just they lie a lot. If their sin is grievous and it's time for punishment, only God would know that. So does it matter which one it is? Knowing Romans 6, 23, that the wages of every sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Knowing that, does it matter? I mean, th they got death. Their towns were destroyed. What do you get? Well, God's not pouring down fire and brimstone on Greentown and Swayze nowadays. Maybe we're good, right? And you may chuckle a little bit, but people think like that even today. They think if we're that bad, God would strike us dead, right? Like he did Song Gomorrah. But the truth is, of course, dispensationally, that is not how God is operating today. And the reason why he struck down Song Gomorrah is for you to remember Lot's wife and to remember why he did that. Because he wants to give grace to the future of the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites. He wants to give grace and, 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 and salvation. But you'd never believe that he would punish people if he never had. And so he did. You see, and he put it in the book, gave it to Abraham, so he would tell his children, remember. Remember what happened when God brought judgment in the flood. Remember what happened when God brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. But meanwhile, we'll get to some of that in a little bit here. We see in verse 21, where God says their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it. Now, is God somehow oblivious to what's going on? Is he just have little spies sitting around and reporting back to him because he can't know all things? Is God not omniscient? Of course, the answer will be yes, he is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But he speaks as if, I've got to go check this out. I've only heard rumors. Isn't that what it sounds like to you? I've got to go down and see what they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me, and if not, I will know. The truth is God already knows, okay? But even according to the law, it teaches that if someone does something with answers without hearing out the matter, it's a shame unto him, right? And so God sends his angels here to investigate as a testimony. And in fact, how many go down to Sodom and Gomorrah? Two. According to the law, how many witnesses were needed for capital punishment? Two. You see, you can't just sentence someone to death with no witnesses or with no evidence or with only one witness. There had to be two. And so God did that. He is just. So what we learn from this verse here is that God is not prejudiced against the Sodomites and against Gomorrah. He is not unrighteous. We'll see later as Abraham starts to negotiate, appeal with the Lord, that he is not impatient. He's not in a hurry to do violence and, and to shed blood. Okay? He's not, neither unjust nor unwise 
God is, as, as Abraham says, the judge of all the earth, and he does right. Okay, and so what we see in verse 21 is God is investigating the matter. He is leaving them without excuse, which is what he does to everybody. How many years was it before the flood, by the way? A lot of years, <laughs> at least 100 before that flood. God leaves men without excuse. He is not quick to anger and quick to vengeance as men are. Okay. And so in verse 22, the men turn their faces from thence. Notice it's just the men, not the Lord. The Lord stays with Abraham, and it's these two other guys, the angels, that go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. The men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. What a privilege to be standing before the Lord. Okay. Many other men in the Bible who had visions of the Lord or whom the Lord visited bowed down. Daniel fell on his face. Isaiah fell on his face. He said, I'm unworthy to be here. Right? And here's Abraham standing before the Lord. It says in Second Chronicles that Abraham was the Lord's friend, was God's friend, the friend of God. There's few people in the Bible that are called God's friends. Moses is one of them, speaking to God as friends. Abraham as well here speaking to God. The way Abraham speaks to God here, you think any second he's going to be zapped, you know, not respecting who he's talking to. But that was the relationship. That was the position he had with God. Remember, Abraham had a privileged position because he was chosen, and God promised to bless him. There was no condition there. Initially, there was a promise. So Abraham stood yet before the Lord, and he starts appealing to him about Sodom and Gomorrah. As he sees the, the, the hills over there and sees the town, he remembers my nephews over there. Remember in Genesis 13 when Lot and Abraham split? Abraham went west, Lot went east, Lot went towards Sodom. It says in Genesis 13, he pitched his tents near Sodom. Remember Genesis 14, it was Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain that the kings of the east came and captured all of their goods and stole all of their women. And Abraham went and rescued him. Remember that? Genesis 14. And why did he do it in Genesis 14? Because of Lot. That's why he did it. He heard they had taken Lot. And so Abraham went and, and rescued those cities because of Lot. And so here again, when the Lord says, I'm going to Sodom to check out this sin problem, and uh, you know, they're, they're going to be destroyed. So Abraham, no doubt, is concerned for his nephew. And so Abraham drew near the Lord and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Who do you think he's thinking about here? Do <laughs> you think he cares about the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites or anybody else who lives anywhere in the land of Canaan? It's his nephew that he's caring about, no doubt. Okay, what about the righteous? He's, he's appealing here to God to do justice to the righteous ones. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Now we know Lot, even though we'll study his character a little, in a little bit, and how it was, he was putting himself in a compromising position. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Peter that Lot was just, and he calls him a righteous man. And so we can put Lot in Abraham's appeal where he says, are you going to destroy the righteous men as well? 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. Now 2 Peter chapter 2, God is uh, speaking through Peter uh, re, for, f to remind Israel, uh, specifically the little flock of Israel, that judgment is coming. That is the point of 2 Peter 2. And so he's describing, remember, the judgments that God has given. Because there are those who scoff and they say the judgment's not going to come, the Lord's not going to come again. And he says, remember the flood. Then he says, remember Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 6, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an end sample unto those that after should live ungodly. Okay, so you notice here Peter explains why we have the account of Sodom and Gomorrah in our Bible. It's to be an end sample unto those that after should live ungodly, that God will bring judgment. Okay, God does not look lightly on it. And he says, and he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And so, Peter acknowledges from what he reads in Genesis 19 that Sodom and Gomorrah were, were wicked places, and Lot was there, and uh, probably the only righteous man in the city. And so, in verse 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And so, why is Lot there? <laughs> this is a good question to ask. Why is righteous Lot there? Okay. There's a problem. We see Lot even had the prob a problem, we'll see in a bit, uh, with, with his own thoughts about how he can be both, you know, Abraham's nephew and bless the Lord and also be in the world and be a part of that and enjoy its riches 
without being affected by it. And that's just incorrect. It's wrong to think that way, and it's the wrong way to minister, and it's, it's wrong for Lot to have thought that. But in verse 9, Peter says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust into the day of judgment to be punished. And so you see here Peter's explaining to the little flock that God will judge. I haven't been telling you a lie. Judgment is going to come, and God knows how to preserve the righteous and punish the wicked. And so, again, God is not indiscriminate, as so many people think he is. Well, he destroyed the whole town. He's not indiscriminate. God knows how to preserve the righteous and knows how to punish the wicked and knows how to tell the difference between the two, you see. If anybody does, the Lord does. And so all that means is a sad testimony to the condition of Sodom and Gomorrah and, by the way, cities after them as well. We'll see in a little bit that it's not just Sodom and Gomorrah. The city of Jerusalem was compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. It was even said that Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have half the sins as you did, Jerusalem. Right? And so it, it's, it's there as an ensample. It's there as a, a, as a, a, a pattern so that they, you can refer to as a proverb almost and say, God will not forget the judgment. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, look what Peter says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Remember, Peter was not preaching Paul's gospel. Peter was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Paul, uh, Peter was preaching that God would come back and judge your enemies and be your, uh, save you from your enemies and establish your kingdom on the earth. Right? That's what Peter was preaching. So by the time he writes 2 Peter, uh, which is many decades after his Pentecostal sermons, people begin to doubt Peter and say, well, Peter, you've been saying this, but... Um, it's not here. In fact, Peter writes this epistle even after Paul was given the revelation of the mystery. And so, what's that prove? Paul was given the mystery. The kingdom hadn't come yet. Paul was given the mystery, and judgment hadn't come yet. So Peter's encouraging them that just because it has not come yet does not mean it will never come. And he says in verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, his promise of judgment, his promise of the kingdom, but his long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you notice what Peter says here. Just because you don't see the fire and the brimstone, just because you don't see the wrath yet, does not mean God is not going to bring it. Just because you haven't seen the fulfillment of Israel does not mean God's not going to bring it. He promised it. Okay, and Peter acknowledges that if it hasn't happened, it only shows God's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. It's not his lack of remembrance of his promise to the righteous. Okay, and so we apply this back to Genesis 19. And think of the days and the weeks and the months and the years before the fire and brimstone came on Sodom and Gomorrah. And all, every one of those days, there was not fire and brimstone in the sky. And that only showed God's long suffering so that none should perish. God is not willing that the, the, that the wicked should perish. In Ezekiel chapter 33, it says this. He doesn't want people to die. He wants them to turn from their sins, you see. That's why Ezekiel 33 says. We know in 1 Timothy 2, 4, what's God's will? Isn't it to see how many men saved? All men saved. That's what God would have happen. That's his will. All men saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So Peter says his long suffering is that he's not, he doesn't want any man to perish. Paul even says he wants all men to be saved according to this, this dispensation of grace where he takes away all conditions to salvation. In Ezekiel 33, he doesn't want the wicked to perish. He wants them to turn from their sins and repent. And so we know from the Bible, God is not quick to anger. God is not someone who enjoys, okay, killing people, destroying them because of their sins. And we know it's because of their sins. God said so, and he proves their sins, and we see that proof in Genesis 19. And so we need to keep that in mind when we read about Psalm and Gomorrah, and we read about these accounts, and people say, well, the Old Testament, God's an angry God. No, actually, he's a long-suffering God. The reason why we have those records of his vengeance is because men kept sinning against God's appeals and against his warnings and, and took his long suffering for granted. Okay? So Genesis chapter 18 is where we're at. And Abraham's asking the question, wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And of course the answer would be no. He's not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. God discriminates. He's able to protect the righteous. Abraham says, peradventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? He says, if there's 50 righteous people, isn't that worthy of preserving this, this place? He says, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous should be as the wicked, and be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? 
And of course, that's a popular phrase that people use to describe situations of which they don't quite understand the justice of it. Here's the Lord saying, I'm going to destroy those cities. Abraham knows his nephews over there going, wait a minute, shouldn't the judge of all the earth do right? What about, what about Lot? Now, why didn't Abraham just come out and say it? God, what about my nephew? He didn't say that. He's, he's appealing here, asking about his justice, you know. But we're learning here about, about God's justice and that he is just. And God responds, and he says, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. It's not just the righteous I will spare in that, in that situation. I will spare the whole city. And so it's not just I'll destroy just the, the wicked and, and save the righteous. God responds with more grace and will spare sinners for the sake of a few. Abraham, of course, responds to this. And he says, well, what if there's just you know, five less than 50, 45? The Lord says, all right, 45. And he goes, well, how about 40? 30? I mean, how low do you go, Lord? And what if there's 10? What if there's 10 righteous men? Will you spare the city? And the Lord agrees eventually that, you know, if there's 10, then I will spare the whole city for the 10 righteous men's sake. Some commentators have thought, well, I wonder what 10 Abraham was thinking about. You got Lot and his wife, a few children there. Maybe he's got 10. Abraham, by the way, had more than that in his household, and they were all circumcised with him in Genesis 17. Surely Lot, righteous Lot, over there doing his ministry, could convince ten people to follow the Lord in righteousness, right? And, of course, the answer would be no. Uh, he didn't, actually, and he lost some of his family to the wickedness in Sodom. That was the price he paid for that house in Sodom, instead of staying out of there in a tent in, in the, uh, the plains uh, west of it. But meanwhile, Abraham is here pleading and appealing to the Lord on, on the, uh, the case of his righteousness. Notice that a Abraham is not pleading for God's mercy. He is not saying, be merciful to those sinners. He recognizes the justice of judging sinners. He's pleading for God's righteousness to prevail. He's pleading and asking God, you should be just toward the righteous men, is what he's pleading for. I mentioned a few weeks ago, and it's something for you to consider, that Really, God's love is found in his justice and his righteousness. Without justice, without righteousness, there is no love. Okay? It's only in justice that you find God's love. Otherwise, you've got sin running rampant and victims being victimized because God is loving. Right? Actually, there needs to be justice done, and that's the only place where love can exist. Biblical love is when you're able to protect your loved one from evil. Otherwise, it's mercy, right? Why don't we just let all sorts of bad things happen to your loved one because we're going to give them grace, right? Well, of course not. You cry for justice. So Abraham cries for justice to protect the righteous ones is what he's pleading for here. Of course, again, we, know the, the, we have the benefit of understanding God's manifold wisdom in that if he's really going to account uh, and evaluate the men in Sodom and Gomorrah, there's not going to be even one. Even Lot is a sinner, Right? The fact that he's called righteous is only in comparison to Psalm Gomorrah. It's not him being sinless, obviously. Psalm 14 says that God looks down at humanity and doesn't find any righteous. Romans 3 says there's none righteous. No, not one. Right? And so if we're really going to ask God to evaluate humanity, we're going to be on the bad, bad end of the stick. But in Genesis 18, Abraham here is appealing for God's justice to occur, for him to do right. You say, why, why would he do that? Well, we do it quite often. We do it when we think that there's innocence happening. There's an injustice happening. We want God to do right. People often quote Genesis 18, verse 25, shall not the judge of all the earth do right in regard to babies. Consider this. Okay? God's a just God, and we know about the gospel and believing Christ's death on the cross for salvation and that application for our souls and, and this sort of thing to, to save us. But what about babies? They can't even communicate. They can't even talk. They can't even read. We can't preach to them if we wanted to. We can try, and they ne don't understand. We know that they can't, that there's something that we think is unjust about God sending babies to hell. And we'd be right, <laughs> because they don't have an opportunity to hear the gospel. They don't have the knowledge of sin. And so one common response to where do babies go when they die is, shall, the ju shall, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Shall not God protect the righteous? The innocent? The, the babies? And the answer would be yes, you see. It's not a question as if Abraham doesn't know the answer. He knows the answer already. He knows that God is righteous. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And yes, he will do right. 
And so we trust God when we don't understand the justice of situations. We trust God to make things right because he is right. In fact, that is what righteousness is. It's God. Okay, so that's something to, to, to remember. In situations where you don't know why things happen the way they do and you don't understand the justice of it all, we should strive to understand, which means we strive to be godly. But God knows. God does understand and God does do right. And he is the judge, by the way. He doesn't have to appeal to someone else. He is the judge, and he does right, okay? And so we should be pleased with that. The judge that, we, that is over the earth is a righteous judge. Meanwhile, let's move on here in, in Genesis chapter 18, down in verse um, 32. <clears throat> he says, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, ten men shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. He should have kept going, by the way. One commentator said he should have kept going down to one because that's all there was, was Lot. Uh, because the city eventually gets destroyed because there wasn't ten. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1, God speaks about Jerusalem and says, Seek out the city of Jerusalem. If you can find one man that executes judgment, I will save the whole city. Silence, crickets. <laughs> there, there wasn't one man in the whole city in Jeremiah 5, 1, apparently. And so this is what God says there. But Abraham stops at ten, and the Lord went his way. As soon, as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. And so in verse 19, there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. So it now turns our attention to Sodom, where the two angels, here it says angels, before it said men. Angels in your Bible are men. They don't have wings. They don't look like strange creatures. They look like men. And uh, Lot welcomes them, uh, maybe not knowing that they are angels, but just that they're strangers, they're sojourners, like he was a sojourner in a tent from a different, a different place. But notice where the angels find Lot here. They find Lot sitting in the gate of Sodom. Now, this isn't the gate like the gate in your front yard, you know, where you got a fence and you got the gate there. That's not what that is. The gate in your Bible, when it talks about the gate and people sitting in the gate, that's talking about the, the place in the city, the place in the town of leadership, rulership, judgment. It's like the, the, the town hall, of what we would call today. That's the gate, okay? And so, so Lot here is sitting in this place, the town center, right, where the business happens, where the, uh, the, the, the disputes are handled. And he's sitting in a seat there, which means he's a judge there. He's, he's in this city operating as a judge. Good for you, Lot, right? Good job, Lot. You climbed the ladder in Sodom. But what does that mean when Lot is sitting in the gate in Sodom? which is about to be destroyed for their grievous sin. Apparently, he's not doing a good job. Apparently, his judgment or his place that he thinks is a place of achievement is not doing anything for this city. Which, if you wanted to preach a lesson on that, you could as well. Consider the achievements that Christians try to do when they build their kingdom, trying to infiltrate and achieve seats of authority without making known the gospel, without preaching God's righteousness. And yes, they hold positions, and Christians sit in high positions, and they get nothing done for the Lord but achieving a position and not saying anything about the Lord. Okay, and this is where we find Lot. Okay, Lot has more possessions than Abraham. He's in a higher status in society than Abraham is. Abraham's in a tent out in the plains, right? Lot here has a house sitting in the gate in the city of Sodom. Which one do you think fares better in the eyes of the world? It would be Lot, be the one that's closer to being successful. But when we compare Abraham and Lot, we see Abraham is the one standing with the Lord. And Abraham is the one that gets blessed by the Lord. And Abraham is the one that, in the end, is standing there watching in the distance, Sodom burning with fire and brimstone. Okay, so you see on the back of your outline, I got a few other comparisons between the uh, the reception that the angels and, uh, have with Abraham and the reception and the time and the location and the events surrounding the angels coming to Lot. Abraham was in a tent outside the city. He was a pilgrim, by the way, a sojourner uh, in the land of Canaan. But Lot, he seemed to be like a sodomite, at least politically. He was a citizen of the city. He wasn't a visitor anymore. Apparently, he was trying to fit in. Lot was in a house, in a city, in a position of leadership. The angels, when they visited Abraham, they visited Abraham in the daylight, the afternoon. Okay? Uh, they visited Lot in the evening, when it was dark. That doesn't mean anything. Okay? Well, when they came to Abraham, they came with good news. When they came to Lot, they didn't come with good news. They came with bad news. And so, you have that comparison as well. The angels, uh, or Abraham rather, had influenced his house so much that they, his whole house 
was circumcised the same day, all the, the men in his house, to follow him in the covenant of circumcision. That was the influence he had on his house, which consisted of hundreds of people. We saw before he had hundreds of servants he had trained to fight with him in his army. Okay. That he had influenced them so much that they followed him in circumcision. Lot, rather, sitting in the gate in Sodom, a part of the city, later in the story, as he tries to convince them to leave, they mock him. They, they attempt to beat him up. No influence whatsoever, though he holds positions and holds uh, possessions. Abraham stood with the Lord. Lot stood with the Sodomites. Abraham ended up watching the destruction from his house. Lot lost his wife and was fleeing from his house. Abraham remained a sojourner in the land. Lot tried everything to, that he could to appear that he was not one. Okay, that's, that's the difference here between Abraham and Lot. Abraham and Lot, uh, Lot's called the righteous man in 2 Peter. He's called just. And yet there's a difference in the way he acted from the way Abraham acted. Abraham, when the angels came, he uh, went around busily preparing this huge feast for them. Remember that? Uh, the steak and the potatoes they ate back there in Genesis chapter 18. And uh, Lot, when they come, the first thing he says, hey, get out of the streets. Come on to my house. Now, he cooks them a dinner there, too. He, in fact, he bows down to him. Look at Genesis 19, verse uh, 1. It says, Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So there's still that heritage that Lot came from. He is Abraham's nephew. He does know the Lord. He's righteous. Bows down before these visitors, and he says, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet. Ye you shall rise up early, and go on your way. Does anybody get from that that Lot's trying to get him to move on as quick as he can? Abraham, rather, said, hey, sit underneath the tree. I'll wash your feet. We'll eat. Stay as long as you want. Lot goes, hey, come into my house, out from the street. I'll feed you in the morning. You can leave. What? <laughs> they came to investigate the city. They didn't want to be hidden somewhere in a house. They want to see what's going on. But he says, that's what, that's what he's inviting him to. They said, no. We will abide in the street all night. It's fine. We'll just stay out here. Lot knows, of course, that's not a good idea. He pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and he entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. So he, Lot, as much as he is able, is, is being hospitable to these people, to these angels that are, he's entertaining, perhaps unawares. But Lot's heart, Lot's... Lot was a part of Sodom. Look at Genesis 13. Lot's heart was in Sodom long before he lived in it. Genesis 13, when he and Abraham split, Lot looked to the east and saw the watered land. In verse 10, he lifted up his eyes. Remember we covered back there the difference between Lot looking with his eyes and Abraham by faith operating. And, and Lot here sees with his eyes all the plain of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere. And that was, of course, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. And so Lot chose Sodom and Gomorrah. He wanted to go there. In verse 12, Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. So at first, Lot just went the direction of Sodom, pitched his tent. By the time we get to Genesis 19, he's no longer just living near Sodom in a tent. He's living in Sodom in a house, part of their operation. Verse 13 says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That, that, didn't take, that, that had no value in Lot's evaluation of where he was going. But Genesis 13 says they were wicked and sinners before the Lord was seemingly, even back in Genesis 13. And so Lot already had his heart towards that. And we see in Genesis 19 the decline of Lot and, and, and how he's become, so much so that he's become a political sodomite, at least, a part of the city, that being a citizen. And his daughters were marrying them. <laughs> he had sons-in-laws who were sodomites. Right, who were part of the city. Lot, of course, was delivered, but it wasn't because of his righteous stand. It was because of his relationship to Abraham and, to, and for God's mercy on the righteous. 1 Timothy 6, 9 is Lot's problem, of course, when it says that those who are rich fall into destruction and, uh, and a snare. They, be, they become ensnared, trapped by the lusts of the flesh, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 9 says. That's what Lot happens, and his wife, that's what happens to her and her, his family. Is that as the angels tell them to flee to the mountains, they're going, we can't stay in the mountains. We've got to stay in this city over here. <laughs> Live in the mountains. You haven't done that for decades. That's the snare of the rich, you see. They forget God's words and discount it for the sake of their own pleasure, for the sake of, this is not how we live. 
as Americans, as we live as rich people. Look at Genesis 19, verse 4, though. Moving on from Lot's character for a moment, I want to deal with what is the problem here in Sodom and Gomorrah. God said their sin was grievous. We've seen that. But uh, what's going on here? So as the angels are staying with Lot, they eat the, eat the feast, and uh, before they can lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, comp com compass the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Now, it makes, special, uh, it makes a special, uh, uh, it, it, it's making special mention here that the men of the city are coming from every quarter. These aren't men from outside the city. And so they're rebels coming and trying to destroy. These are men of the city, and they're old and young. It's not just one generation. Well, those young kids these days, you know, they're rebels. Young and old, you see. And it's men from all around the town. It's not just that there's the, the bad side of the tracks and the good side of the tracks. People from all around the town, young and old, men of the city, come and compassed around the house, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And so this is what the request is. Um, they want to know these men in the carnal sense. They want them to come out and join in the festivities because Sodom is where we have a good time. It's Mardi Gras, right? I mean, you walk around and it's all sensual and sexual and anybody with everybody. We want to know these guys. Bring them out. And Lot's going, nah, not tonight, guys. We'll keep these, these fellows in the house. In verse 6, Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. There's no way getting around these verses. I know people will try to distort these and say, well, this is not some sin of homosexuality. Well, how the way can these men want to know these men? Lot's calling it wicked, wickedness. It's a sin, and we'll see you later. It's a sexual sin. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Virgin daughters, let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as good as in your eyes. Righteous Lot, giving up his daughters. How brave. No, that's sarcasm, of course. Why is he doing that? You say, how could he do that? How could he give up his daughters, his own children, to such wicked, vile people? And, of course, we don't do that at all. We don't give up our children to any wickedness or expose them to any sin or any problems, right? We don't do that in our country. No, we don't do that at all. These wicked sodomites. Lot, why is he doing this with his daughters? Maybe he's choosing the lesser of two evils. Oh, we don't do that today, do we? We always choose right. If there's no right, we don't choose at all. No, we choose the lesser of two evils as well. Maybe Lot made that calculation. Well, it's either my daughters or these two angels from the Lord. Daughters, there you go. Right? Lesser of two evils. Well, don't we know that evil is still evil and we shouldn't do either one? Right? Well, you see how, how compromised Lot was in in this position. Why is he living in a place where he's, he's exposing his daughters to these sons of Sodom and in this place where he has to compromise in this way, the people wonder, why does he offer these two daughters to these men? Notice also Lot says, do ye to them as is good in your eyes. So you see, even in his appeal, he doesn't want any harm to come to his daughters. And perhaps he's thinking, hey, these guys are homosexuals. They don't want these girls anyway. Could be reasonable, right? Why would he kick them out like that? Why would he send them out among them? He says, for therefore, I don't, with these men do nothing. With my daughters, yes, my, these men, nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. They came here to be protected. Right? They came here, he knows, to see what's going on in this city. And I don't want them to see you. They said, this is the mob, the crowd, they said, stand back, Lot, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow, Lot, came in to sojourn. This guy's a visitor. He's not even a real sodomite. And he will needs be a judge. He's trying to judge us. Now we will deal worse with him, with thee, than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So no doubt these were violent men, if nothing else. Okay, and they, they said, well, Lot, you're trying to judge us. You're not even one of us. We're going to deal with you worse. But the men in the house, the angels, put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And so we have here the events that occurred that triggered, it. we see in verse 12, uh, the angels say, that's it, we've seen enough. <laughs> we can't even spend one night here. That's how bad it is. In verse 12, he says, Hast thou here any besides your son-in-law, thy sons, your daughters, 
angels don't know as much as God does. They have to ask Abraham or Lot about it. And he says, whatsoever thou hast in this city, bring them out of this place. Whoever you have in this city, it's part of your Bible study. Right? He's going, well, none. Right? But he says, bring them out. Okay, because he says in verse 13, we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. So there's no more hiding it. There's no more investigation. We've seen it. It's great. We will destroy this place. You better get out with you and yours, with who you have in the city. And so at this point, we want to deal with what sin is in Sodom to cause this judgment, to cause this destruction of the entire city. What is this sin? And how great it must be in order for us not to receive fire and brimstone, but for them to receive a t total annihilation. Right? What is this sin? Look at Luke 17, verse 28. Psalm Gomorrah appears more than a dozen times in your Bible, referring back to the time when God poured out judgment on these great sinners. And it's self-righteous individuals that look back at that story and say, well, we're not like them. It's self-righteous individuals that say that. Because as we'll see, it's not just the sin of homosexuality, which of course is evident in Genesis 19, as those men wanted to know the other men in his house. But it was other sins as well. Luke 17, verse 28. Jesus says, Just as the days of Noah were, likewise as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. Ate, drank, bought, sold, planted, built. We do that as well. It's not a sin to eat, is it? It's not a sin to plant and build, is it? It's not a sin to do these things, is it? Well, no, it's not. And that's what they did. You see, these people were not uh, primitive. These people, as we've seen before in, in Cain's lineage, these people were not uh, averse to hard work and averse to achievement and success and growing things. They built a city, right? In Luke 17, 28, Jesus says, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. They had jobs. They had careers. They had plans. They were living their lives until fire and brimstone came. That's what the Lord's trying to warn them about. We're not like Sodom and Gomorrah. We're achieving things. We just built a new park in the city. Right? Well, the next day, fire and brimstone came down. See, sin doesn't always have the appearance that, you, that people think it does. You know, but God sees things a little bit differently. <clears throat> and he says, even thus, Shall it be in the day where the, the son, when the Son of Man is revealed? People will be eating and drinking and living their life. Uh, and the great sin, the great peril is that they've rejected God. They've rejected His righteousness. They've rejected His way of thinking, His justice, His judgment. That's the problem. And I, I didn't seem to think that many people throughout history, many times throughout history, many places throughout history, could live without God. Just fine. And that's exactly what Sodom and Gomorrah was like. Okay. That's why they were deserving of brimstone and fire during of God's judgment. People say, well, sodomy is a word we use nowadays to describe unnatural sexual satisfaction <laughs> with same-sex people, particularly males and males. Well, this is true. It's the way we use the word. And that wasn't the only sin in sodomy. Sodomy is associated with homosexuality because of Genesis 19, verse 5, where there were men who wanted to know the men inside the house. So obviously you have a homosexual act going on there. But it wasn't just homosexuality. It wasn't just that. There was a bigger problem. Just like in our country, where homosexuality is the political debate, but that's not the real problem. The real problem didn't start when homosexuals wanted to get married. The real problem started 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when fornication became acceptable. Simple sex outside of marriage, adultery, is no longer talked about as some grievous sin. That was the real problem. When people saw the sexualization of our society and said, you know what, sex is fine. Forget God's boundaries and God's instructions. That's when homosexuality later came up as a symptom. That's when we let that cat out of the bag, you see. So it's not just homosexuality, as again we'll see here in the Bible. Look at Jude, verse 7, the book of Jude. So we're talking about what sin was in Sodom. What did Sodom look like to deserve such judgment? <clears throat> book of Jude. Similar to Peter's writing about the judgment to come upon Israel, upon the world. It says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to what? Fornication. Fornication. Now, fornication, in case you ever wonder if there's a place in the Bible talking about sex outside of marriage, that's the word right there. Fornication. 
Okay? It's sexual practices, lewd behavior, outside of God's designed purpose for marriage. Fornication. It includes adultery. It includes lusts of your heart. It includes homosexuality. Any sort of lewd sexual behavior outside of marriage is what fornication is. And that's what Sodom and Gomorrah was like. Their lives, their culture was sexualized. Everything, that was the point of living. That was the greatest pleasure you can have. Why not pursue that? Right? And you say, well... You know, the number one biggest money make maker on the internet is pornography. Okay, maybe that's why Billy Graham said in 1968 that our country is like Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Maybe that's why he saw adultery running rampant and a law in Colorado that said adultery was illegal, but nobody cared. It was just taken off the books a few years ago because it was outdated. People obviously are committing adultery all the time and getting divorces and whatnot. And they just took the law off because it, it wasn't being enforced at all. Right? That's the problem, you see. Fornication. You see, the sensitivity God has to sin is much greater than ours. We compare ourselves with ourselves. We say, I haven't had as many wives as that guy. You know, or I don't think as bad thoughts as that guy. But to consider the world that we live in and what's around us, things that are close to your home. How many broken marriages are in your family? And not just the broken marriages, but the lusts of people's hearts. The cheating, right? Which now on television shows and movies is just part of part of what it's like. You know, you got single daddy, single mommy, you know, because they cheated on the other one, and that's just what it is. It's no longer a bad thing, it's just life, because you've stopped loving each other, right? The idea that you get married because you love one another, and when you stop loving the other one, then it's the time to stop being married, right? How silly of an idea that is, and yet that's what our world produces. You're only together when you love somebody so that you can please each other. That's why you do that. That's wrong. But Jude 7 says, they gave themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth as an, for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah and the story in Genesis 19 is an example for us to see, to evaluate what's deserving of God's judgment. And God does not set the bar that high, is what I'm trying to say. People tend to set Sodom and Gomorrah on a level of sinfulness that's far greater than what they can ever attain. And I don't see that in the Bible. Look at Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16. Instead of reading this chapter with self-indignation and accusation of everyone else, I think we need to read it with a little more humility, studying Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible, realizing that we may be more like that than what we think. Just like Lot, who lived there and, and hesitated to leave and lingered, around the city because, hey, just give them another chance, just a little bit longer, they're not that bad. Uh, yeah, Lot, you're living too close to the city. They're that bad. You're living too close to the world and to sin to realize how bad it is. You get numb to it. Ezekiel 16, verse 48. Look what um, Ezekiel writes. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom, thy sister. Now, before I go any further, Ezekiel 16 is talking about the sins of Jerusalem. Okay. Um, that's what it's about. Ezekiel 16, verse 2 says, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Is what Ezekiel 16 is about. So verse 48, it says, Sodom is your sister, Jerusalem. She nor her daughters have done as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. So Ezekiel says, Sodom and Gomorrah did not do like you're doing, Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem had a temple. Jerusalem had priests. Jerusalem had a religion. And so did the Sodomites. Sodomites had temples. The Sodomites had religion, right? The Sodomites were pious people, right? They were wicked. Ezekiel 16, verse 49 says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. This was the sin of Sodom. What's the number one on the list? Pride. That's it? Pride? Pride. <laughs> which, uh, from which comes all contention. Pride. Who among us doesn't have a little bit of that? Pride. Uh, is, what's it, next? Fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. Maybe that's why they were able to commit themselves so much to fornication, because they had so much bread. They were, just, they were so wealthy. They had so much time on their hands. They weren't worried about, you know, growing food for the next meal. They had all of that. They, they were idle. And doesn't Paul talk about idle hands? And so their, their abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were so wealthy, apparently, they didn't even consider the poor. That's not like us at all. 
And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. You see that? And so we see a description of her sins here, which sounds very normal as far as sins go. And yet they're grievous in the sight of God. They're wicked. Okay. Isaiah 3 verse 9 says that they boasted in their sins. Sodom, not only did they sin, but they, they did not hide them. They didn't hide them. Okay. They did, it, just, it happened openly. Drive down an interstate, okay? You'll know what I'm talking about. I drove down an interstate a couple days ago. Uh, you drive down an interstate, what do you see mostly on the billboards? Signs for beer, signs for strip clubs, signs for divorce lawyers. You ever wonder why that is? We live in a world of sin, folks. That's a world of sin. Right there next to the interstate. You take a break driving. You know, have some fun. This is the world that we live in. It's a present evil world as Paul describes it. I don't think they were debating same-sex unions in Sodom. That's not the issue. They weren't defining biblical marriage in Sodom. And just as laughable as that is, it's just as laughable today to think that's the real issue as well. They went back there in Sodom going, you know what? Same-sex people ought to get married. That, that wasn't the problem. The problem was that they were laughing how anybody could tell anybody else what to do with their own bodies. Now, doesn't that sound more similar to our culture than the other? I know the politicians talk about same-sex unions and marriage and things like that. I know that's what they talk about on the news channels. But really, the argument people have today is, how can you tell me what to do with my body? Right? And that's the problem. Fornication. People don't know who they are. God made us, you see. That's the issue. So the issue wasn't just, you know, is a marriage between a man and a woman or a man and a man? And they come knocking on the door. Hi, we're the Democrats. We want the man and the man. You know, that's not it. Their whole culture was sexualized. And that was just a response to it. It wasn't about gender, male and male or female and male. It was about lust, about power, about idolatry. There were temples of the Sodomites in Jerusalem in 1st and 2nd Kings that Josiah had to tear down. Temples to it. It was about sensuality, about what you feel. If it feels good, do it, right? That was the idea. That was the culture. That's what it was teaching. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 24. That's why you don't see, and this is why there's debate in, 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 our, in our culture about homosexual marriages, because quite frankly, the Bible doesn't talk about it directly. You say, you're a preacher of the Bible. Who, that, you're, that's wrong. It does. No, no, no. Listen to what I say. It doesn't talk about it directly. It talks about it indirectly. Because homosexuality is just one kind of fornication, which it does talk about very directly. But the debate in your, in your politics is never to prohibit adulteries and to forbid fornication. You'd get laughed at. It's just about homosexuality, this one thing, right? The greater picture is sexual sin entirely. And that's what Paul deals with in Romans chapter 1. When he says in Romans chapter 1, when they gave up on God, down in verse 24, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Okay. It's not just men and men and women and women. This is anybody with anybody. Right. That's the problem here. God gave them up to their uncleanness, the lust of their own hearts, to do whatever their bodies needed to do with each other. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. What matters less than what God wants is what I feel needs to happen, what my body desires. Okay. Romans 1 verse 20. 25. Verse 26 says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another. Men versus men. So there's your homosexuality right there. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. They, didn't like, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. That's the point. The reason why we need marriage, and I won't qualify that with heterosexual marriage, because marriage is man and a woman in Genesis chapter 2. God made a woman for the man. The reason why we need marriage, according to the Bible, is because biblical marriage creates sexual restraint. And by saying that, I will be labeled a prude and a Victorian and old-fashioned, but that is exactly why God created Otherwise, our whole culture and our entire lives become sexualized. And as a result, we don't do right. As a result, we become base. 
As a result, we don't have good judgment. As a result, there's no more love. Remember when Jesus says love will wax cold? That wasn't because people will just start hating each other. It's because they start treating each other as objects for sexual pleasure. No more love. When God created marriage, he said, you know what? You have to love that woman. <sighs> and that's the, that's the task that we all live up to. But that's the instruction you see in marriage. You have to love that woman. And by the way, it's a woman, not anyone you want. And that has to do with respecting women and children. Because why not marry a child? Why not forget marriage? We don't need that anymore. Why not? Can I, why can't I please myself with children? Right? Because God said a man and a woman. That's why. Respect to women and children is a result of biblical marriage. When Jews in the Old Testament lived in a pagan society that worshipped gods with their bodies, with sex, for Jews to say that God created a man and a woman to be married res brought respect to women, which they didn't otherwise have. You know why in pagan sexualized cultures there was homosexuality? Because if you have sex with a woman, there's a risk of getting pregnant. This is a problem. This is a big problem if you're trying to please yourself constantly, right? So forget that. I'm going over here to find this little boy. I'm going over here to find this man. Women were cast aside in those cultures. Women were disrespected. In societies that worship sex, women are disrespected in every sense of the word. This is why God created biblical marriage, to bring respect to the inferior gender, to women, to create respect for children and for family. And God knew Abraham would teach his children and raise his household. And what did Lot do? He said, all right, girls, well, if you want to, you know, go with that sodomite out to dinner tonight, that's all right. No, Lot, you need to leave. Get your tent, pack up and leave. It's not the place for your children. This is the issue in the Bible when it comes to the sin of Sodom. It's not just homosexuality. It's a bigger problem. And it's something that's much more closer to home, I think, than what people think. The law, of course, given to Israel for bad sex outside of marriage. Leviticus 18 describes all of that. One verse in Leviticus 18 talks about man lying with mankind as a woman and calling that an abomination. But you forget the other 25 verses that says, oh yeah, and if you lie with a woman not married to her, or you lie with your mother-in-law, or lie with your niece, or your nephew, or your uncle, there's 15 other verses there. They're all abominations. Sexual problems, you see. That was the issue. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 17, God said there will be no whore in Israel, and there will be no sodomite in Israel. That was the law. They won't be here. That sin, sexual de deviancy, will not be in Israel, because they would honor God's instructions for life. They weren't animals. They were God's chosen people in Israel. And so that was the law amongst them. So back in Genesis 19, again, there's a bigger issue, hopefully. I've shown you some of these verses. It's not just homosexuality, even though that is a grievous sin. But it's not any more grievous than adultery and fornication and forgetting marriage altogether. And you can list the statistics, right or wrong, about the marriage rate in our culture. That's the problem. And why don't people get married? Because they don't know that's what they should do, because they don't fear God that that's what they need to do. They don't trust that God's way is the right way. And so, moving on, Genesis 19. Let's look at Genesis 19, verse 12. Now we've dealt with that. The men said to Lot, go find the people that are yours and bring them out, because we're going to destroy this place. And so Lot goes, uh, in verse 14, spake unto his sons-in-law, which were married, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get ye out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seems as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And so that's, that's what I sound like when I talk about what I'm talking about tonight. They mock me, saying, well, <laughs> you're just talking about bad things happening that never happen, and people really love each other, and they have good lives, and they're never married, and they're homosexual. But I'm not talking about how good a life you can live. I'm not talking about how good it feels or how much you love one another. I'm talking about what God's way is, that's all. I'm talking about what God's way, and it's, it's the right way. But you get mocked for talking like that. In verse 15, when the morning arose, so in the evening he's talking to his sons-in-law, they're mocking him. In verse 15, when the morning arose, the angels hastened and said, Lot, it's been all night. Uh, take your wife, your two daughters, which are here. Forget the other people, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Leave. Look at verse 16. And while he lingered, <laughs> Lot doesn't seem to be in a big hurry, does he? 
While he lingered, the men laid hold on his hand. They grabbed him. They grabbed his wife. They grabbed his dogs, and they dragged him outside the city. We need to leave. Judgment's going to happen. I, I get the impression that that may not happen again, that God goes and actually drags you out before judgment comes. And so even here, he shows mercy to Lot because he made a promise to Abraham to bless those that bless him. While he lingered, the men laid hold of his wife and on his daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Run, look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. This is it. You're out of the city. Go, run. You're going to be destroyed here. What's Lot say? Oh, no, 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 not yet. Not so, Lord. I, look, why don't we just go over here to the city next door? We can't go to the mountain. He says, I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. See the lack of faith there, the lack of trust in what God's messengers here are saying. Behold now, the city is near to flee, is near to flee unto and is a little one. Oh, let me escape there and my soul shall live. Why can't he live in the mountains with God? In verse 21, he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing, that I will not overthrow this city, for that which, uh, which thou hast spoken. So he lets him go over to this city called Zoar, this small little town next to it. And the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar, and the Lord reigned upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and destroyed the cities. Notice a couple things here is that one, the brimstone and fire came from where? Hell? No, it came from heaven. You hear people talk about fire and brimstone preaching. Fire and brimstone preaching is what these angels do in Genesis 19 when they say, you need to get out because you're going to be consumed with the iniquity of the city. Fire and brimstone preaching is what the angels said when they said, we will destroy this place. And so if you ever talk like that and say, well, God's going to bring judgment on sinners, that's fire and brimstone preaching. You don't have to spit to preach like that. Okay? That's what it is. Fire and brimstone and coming down on, uh, as judgment. And fire and brimstone coming out of heaven, by the way. People tend to consider, well, that's a hellish way to talk. Well, no, it's really not. It's God who sent the judgment. It came from heaven, and it's a righteous thing for the salvation of the rest of the world being exposed to this sinfulness, if nothing else. Okay, it would help Lot. And so the Lord rained down brimstone and fire and destroyed the city. But it wasn't just for the sake of our reading an account of people being judged by the Lord that God put this in the Bible. It was because God's judgment is real, and he will bring it again. Romans 1, 17, Paul says, we know the judgment of the Lord. He will come back in judgment again. Jesus taught it. Paul taught it. Every prophet in the Bible taught about God's judgment to come. And so we need to respect that and understand that it's a warning. It's an example. We study this as an example that it will happen again, and we should not take God's grace for granted. But also we learn here, that Jesus Christ saved Lot. He was merciful and remembered the righteous. Now we know that none are righteous, no, not one, but we know that God is offering righteousness for free when we put our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for the Sodomites. He died for ungodly sinners. Romans 4, verse 5. If you can't put yourself in that city as a Sodomite or in Gomorrah, you can't be saved. Romans 4, verse 5. God died for the ungodly for the wicked, for the sinners who do not deserve it. Okay? That was not being offered in Genesis 19. Understand that. The angels did not preach in that city. There will be a man who comes and dies for all your sins. Trust in him for salvation. That was not being offered. Dispensationally, their offer of salvation was when those angels came and he, they said, you need to come with me. And they didn't. Their sin was evident, you see. Praise God that he's offering grace today and is not doing that. Because he walked into your house, into our house, into the house of the world, and saw wickedness and just poured out fire and brimstone, we'd all be in a heap of trouble. But instead, God today is offering grace to sinners, to the same Sodomites, the same Gomorrahites, and saying, we, I will save you by my grace. That's how much love God has. He commends his love to die for sinners, you see. So Genesis 19 is a picture of God's judgment, but in comparison to God's grace today, we can see how much God committed his love toward us, and that he does not pour out fire and brimstone, offering grace today. We can't say with Billy Graham that God's going to pour out fire and brimstone in America today because today is the dispensation of grace where God is offering peace to the world if they would only trust his son and be saved. That's all it takes to trust the gospel to be saved. 
doesn't matter what sin it is you have, homosexuality, fornication, lying, cheating, adultery, pride, lust, sin. It's all sin and wickedness, and God hates it. It needs to be dealt with, and Christ dealt with it on the cross. Okay, Christ died for ungodly sinners like those of Sodom and Gomorrah, like us. So we can learn lessons from this. Any questions, any comments? We'll pick it up at uh, uh, the following verses next week, dealing with their escape. Any questions? All right. I know this was kind of a, a frowny night, a gloomy night passage, but that's what it's intended to be, I think, the, uh, the judgment there. It wasn't all smiles like it was last week with uh, Sarah and the children, but that's another contrast between Abraham and Lot. Abraham was given life. Lot was exposed to death and judgment. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. I pray we would never forget that we are the sinners for which you died. And it's only because of what you did that we can say that we're justified by faith, not by what we've done. So I pray that we would show that grace to those around us, preaching that gospel, not taking sin lightly, but making sin what it is, a wicked thing that requires your blood to pay for. So we're grateful for you doing that and for teaching us lessons like Psalm of Gomorrah. Amen. Thank you, folks.